So today we're doing Walter Lanyon. I'm gonna mostly gonna do this book, Your Heritage, which I pre-read most of it. It seems to be pretty practical, um, very in line with Neville. The thing I really like about Walter Lanyon's work um, is that he uses a lot of the exact same um, Bible quotes and and phrases uh, that Neville uses and then defines them the same way. Now, it's not known, and I mean, I like looked into it, it's not known for sure that Walter Lanyon was also a student of Abdullah. However, Walter Lanyon wrote a book called Abd Allah, uh, Teacher and Healer, which I have not read, but just given the title alone and uh, speculation I've seen from other people, there's the idea that that's probably about Abdullah. Um, now, Neville and Walter were contemporaries. Uh, Walter is a little bit older. He started writing, um, I think, like 15 years, maybe 20 years before Neville did. Um, but they were alive at the same time. It is not known if they had any correspondence. And actually, that's something I emailed Mitch Horowitz, who's a historian on these issues about, and he didn't have a definitive answer. So I don't know if they ever read each other's books or wrote each other letters or whatever. However, if they never did, if they never met, or even if they did meet, or even if they both were students of Abdullah, still, the similarities in their work, no matter how that relationship was or wasn't, uh, display that ultimately all of these teachings, no matter who they come from, they're reminders you left yourself. They're like, they're literally like notes on the fridge. So when you see the same phrases repeated and defined in the same way, um, it's not because they were copying each other or because, well, that's how Abdullah taught it. It's because those are actual truths, like among <laughs> this sea of totally shape-shifting facts where nothing is ever really totally concrete. These are the handful of facts. And you display, and you're choosing to display them to yourself in this way at this time so that you can apply them and so that you can use them towards, you know, your goal of mastery, your goal of mastery over imagination. All right, so let's shift over to that page and we'll get started. I got my little, uh, got some cherry blossoms up today. Let me scoot that. Just adjust it. So before I start on your heritage, I wanted to read a little bit of um, the end of another book. It's the last chapter of Joybringer called True Prayer. And of course, for anyone who knows Neville, you will know that um, his definition of uh, prayer or effective prayer is, is the same as his definition of feeling, um, which is believing you've received that which you desire already and being thankful for having already received it, even though there's no evidence in the exterior world. Okay, true prayer. We often hear the remark, I gave myself a treatment. And tr <clears throat> treatment, by the way, is a, was a common uh, way among New Thought teachers uh, to talk about imaginal acts or other sort of... <clears throat> any other way you would rearrange your mind towards something. Um, Joseph Murphy used the word a lot and Reverend Ike. When Reverend Ike would do... He would do like large audience imaginal acts, but he would always call them treatments. And I'm pretty sure Florence Scoville Shin was also really into calling it a treatment. Neville, interestingly enough, as far as I know, never used that word. He always used imagination, imaginal act, uh, assumption, uh, mind, uh, speech. He would use words like that. He wouldn't use the word treatment, which is pretty. It's pretty interesting. I don't know if that was a. I mean, he was very. He's very conscious. And, um, you know, specific type of person. So I'm sure that was a very intentional choice to separate himself from other New Thought teachers who were 
quite popular at that time. Okay, we often hear the remark, I gave myself a treatment for this or that. I want to demonstrate so-and-so, or I have worked so patiently to make that demonstration. Demonstration is equivalent to manifestation. All of which means that we are working for a material thing in a very material way. Perhaps we think that we are not but sure that we are, and it is a small wonder that the results are so poor. What a man does when he treats himself or treats another in the truest sense of the work is not to pray for something to come to pass. For everything that is worthwhile, good and real, already came to pass. Creation is already perfect and intact. What he should do when he treats is to bring his thoughts in line with a divine mind. And when this is done for a single moment, the demonstration is as sure to follow as day follows night. This is the point so often overlooked. We find teachers, practitioners, and healers trying to demonstrate things, never once taking cognizance that it is already demonstrated, that it is already here. And all we have to do when we treat is to get in line with it. I mean, the similarities to Neville there are like insane. I mean, uh, you know, when it comes to Neville's refrain of it is already done, I think that's a good enough size for it. This thought gives treatment a radical and new impetus. It starts as the master started with gratitude for the thing already at hand. <clears throat> it acknowledges at that very outset that the results are already assured and perfect. It has, in reality, only one thing to do, and that is to get the thought and rapport with truth. This is the mission of prayer. If a man treats for health, he will get much surer and better results if he will simply know that health is already perfect and that what he is going to do is to change his thought about it. Going to replace the thought of sickness with the thought of health. Then he will get in touch with the real life and immediately his demonstration is completed in the flesh, in earth as it is in heaven. What a wonderful thing it is to know that when we sit down to a problem, we can say, well, the first thing I have to be happy about is that this very problem is already worked out. The thing that I have to do is to put myself in line to receive it. Just think of it, dear reader. Whatever your problem may be, it is already worked out right now. It is only waiting for you to get your thought in tune with it. Isn't this a glorious and inspiring start for any problem that may come to you? Uh, when I first, I want to read this chapter in particular. I'm going to read the rest of the book, but this chapter in particular, because I love this. This is a great reminder to have on hand. Whenever something comes up in your life that you would consider a problem, you can just remind yourself that the solution already exists. That alone can yield the solution. Um, it's just like it's just the best. It's just the best, most wonderful reminder right there. You are not getting rid of anything when you treat. So many people think they have something to get rid of. They have not. What they are suffering from is the lack of something, and that something is God, life, heaven. When we begin treating by giving thanks that this problem is already worked out, we feel something push towards us mentally and fill in the vacuum which the so-called trouble seemed to fill. What a jubilant thought, what a thanksgiving, to suddenly come to the understanding of, my problem is already worked out. My part is merely to clear away the mist and behold the truth. <clears throat> What a new zest. There is no fear of fear of failure, for it is already done. No thought of possible mishaps. The way is straight, simple, and narrow. It leads straight to your destination and joy of joys. We have already started in that direction. Because we know that the perfect destination is already set for us. So, dear reader, your problem is worked out. Get busy then and put your thought in line with the divine. Get busy harmonizing your thought with the God thought 
and you will find that the mist of wrong thinking, which has obscured your perfect birthright from you, is cleared away. I shall call to your remembrance such things as these. All that the Father hath is thine. Ask, and ye shall receive. Prove me, and see if I will not pour out a blessing, and many other similar assurances. God has been urging us to get in line with the true state of life, which is already perfect and eternal, which is already harmonious. He is urging us to turn from the mortal testimony of incompleteness and say, It is done. I will now align myself with it. You remember when you were a child how some of your arithmetic problems were stubborn and how much it helped when someone came along and worked them out for you and said, Now go over them. Get in line with correct thinking and then put them on your own paper correctly. That is, they showed you the solutions and you would copy them. But you, the, the instruction was to understand it as you copied it. That was a happy release from worry. And today the divine voice is speaking, telling you that your problems are worked out. And that all you have to do is get in line with this wonderful truth. A house divided against itself shall fall. And so a man who has divided his attention 50-50 between God and the appearances of matter will fail. You could also look at the, so the equivalent of this, of, of this uh, comparison here would simply be imagine, like what do you, imagination, what you've imagined uh, to be or what you've affirmed for, what you've visualized for, whatever, and then the current circumstances, uh, the, the way that your life appears to be now. So let's say you were imagining for a certain job and you imagined already having the job but the outer world says you you have an interview dude he's like a thousand other people applied for this job you're not going to get it so th those would be that would be the juxtaposition and so your, your mind would be going back and forth being like well i know what i imagined but yeah the, i mean there are a ton of people applying for this they never called me back yada yada that whole line of bullshit right which is which is faithlessness if a man keeps his eyes constantly on the ground, he cannot see the stars. Likewise, if a man keeps examining into his material condition, weighing, checking, taking note of everything, he cannot dwell much on the it is done of spirit, for he is closing the channel. This is talking about putting way, 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 way too much stock in what you see in the exterior world right now. And thinking that's the only thing that's possible. When you begin to treat yourself, just think, my problem is already worked out. And having taken this mental stand, you do not need to examine my problem all the time. Perhaps a good illustration of how the attention or thought should be aligned on God would be that of a man looking through to a patch of sunlit landscape on the other end. The man uh, who knows how to treat correctly will keep his eyes fastened on the destination and will not go stumbling along trying to examine the rough walls of the tunnel and believing that at every step he is getting into a worse state. He will go buoyantly along knowing that his problem is already solved for he can see the solution at the other end of his way. Um, Neville uh, had a really great metaphor for this too, which is the movie. Uh, so like you go to a movie theater and, you know, the prior showing is not done yet. So you walk in and watch the ending and then you stay for the show that you paid for to watch and watch the whole movie again. And when all the drama is going on that makes it seem like there isn't a happy ending coming, you don't care because you already saw the ending. You already saw the happy ending. You already know what happens. This is the same uh, metaphor here. You know, like the idea is that don't lose yourself, don't lose your mind in all the unfolding, like all of the drama that has to take place in order to get you to the end. Don't take a detour and stay stuck in one of those states. Know that your end is assured and have that faith and keep your mind focused there. Behind the dim unknown standeth God, within the shadow keeping watch above his own. In other words, your unfolding is divinely guided. So your end is assured. Uh, remember, he has chosen you and he is responsible for you. And he is not a respecter of persons. Another famous Neville refrain. Uh, what, you, what you see the other man possess, 
can also be yours if you will know that God is impartial and that he bestows no favors upon individuals but offers the open fount to all. In other words, I mean, we talked about this, and for anyone who's familiar with non-duality, uh, you know that God and creation are one. They're not separate. And so that is simply, uh, you know, this whole... Um, this whole this whole idea uh, that God is no respecter of persons means like you can look at it in a negative way, you can look at it in a positive way, but it is neutral because it just means that every state is available and open to you. You're never being denied a state that you would claim as awesome or good or like too good for you. However you want to label it, you're never being denied the most wonderful state in the world. You just have not tuned into it adequately enough. You just haven't put your tuner there. Uh, but however, the, the other side of that is you can, for as long as you want, for as many of them as you want to experience, identify with really awful, really, really like, you know, intense suffering. Um, those states, you can dwell in those states your entire life if you want, if that is your insistence. Um, uh, so it's totally neutral. You're never being denied anything, and you're never being uh, kept from experiencing anything uh, in any way, or whatever flavor you want to um, label that state. Of all, but of all the wondrous things, the most wonderful is the knowledge that no matter where you are, no matter what your problem may be, there stands this one glorious thing. The problem is already worked out. My business is to get in line with it. To get in line means to fasten the thought, once and for always, on God as the perfect principle of life, operating through you and by you and around you. What more can you want, O ye of little faith? <laughs> okay. Um, and by the way, I mean, um, when when Lanyon is talking about God, he is talking about imagination. Um, it's explained in, in his other books. Um but he is also talking about this larger, non-dual, God is everything. And he is talking about the Father. Um, and this book, Your Heritage, I don't know how much he's going to touch upon it. In A Lamp Unto My Feet, which is one of the later books, there's a lot more explanation. Um, th there is really very little difference in his teachings, a lamp unto my feet. Um, probably the well of living waters and God of a God in action, if I'm remembering that book right, would be the ones where you'd see the most concise um, his definitions of God. But I mean, I've read enough of the guy to know that it, the way he talks about things is very much not very different from Neville. Sometimes he has some little sneaky assumptions in there that are very similar to Joseph Murphy assumptions. Uh, like one I was reading earlier was basically, you know, if you are going to wish something evil upon someone else, uh, that's going to be returned to you. Uh, and, and the premise there is that because we're all one entity, um, so the idea that you could block your own good by uh, wishing evil onto others. Now, that is an assumption. However, uh, one thing Neville did caution all the time uh, was that, you know, the law is neutral. You know, as we just explained, when God is no respecter of persons. Um, you know, for, for good or for bad, you can imagine anything for another person. So you can certainly imagine negative things for other people um, if you want. But, yeah, my po only point there is that he does have some little... Uh, Walter Lanyon does have some little sneaky assumptions um, about things that aren't necessarily in not line with Neville's teachings. However, overall, uh, they're very equivalent. And when he talks about God, he's talking about the same God that Neville is talking about. Okay. Your Heritage, which I don't know the year of this book, but this, this I'm pretty sure this is before any of Neville's books came out. Your power to demonstrate, if in a fit of insanity a ship's captain should destroy or cut loose the rudder of his boat, while in mid-ocean, at what port would he finally land? At the port of chance, 
and who can say what that port would be? Perhaps it would be the harbor of his dreams. Possibly by some wild fate, the wind and waves might carry him rudderless into the desired haven, but the odds would be so great against him that no one would care to take such a hazard. For a ship without a rudder, though it might have on board mines of the most trained excellence and the most perfect instruments of nautical science, would fittingly resemble many a man whose mind is full of practical truth and yet is being shipwrecked on the shoals of indecision and waiting. It is certainly true that the rudderless ship in mid-ocean meets with no opposition as to the direction of its course. All ways are open to it. Any port is available. It may turn about in any direction without hindrance and yet be making no real progress because it has lost its rudder. With all the power in the world stored in its mighty hull, it will yet get nowhere and will at last run on a reef, going down to shipwreck and disaster. Just such will be the fate of hundreds of honest truth seekers. They have the letter, but not the spirit to direct. And because of this, all are all their lives counted among the listless waiters, lacking the guidance of the unseen hand, which is but hazily formulated in their minds, and the lack of which leaves them derelicts on the world's trackless ocean. They are lacking in that essential innate power which, when used aright, enables a man to accomplish almost, uh, almost what he will. One ship, as we all know about, is able to sail west, and another to take its course eastward, both carried onward by taking advantage of the same favoring wind. But it is the knowing how to use this power and the ability to subject it to our needs that carries us to the desired port and enables us to make life's journey a success. Just as all will concede that no ship ever starts on a voyage without having a destination definitely in view, so it should be with us. None of us should start in to demonstrate an indefinite truth. We, must fo we, we follow too much the careless habit of letting truth do the work of guiding us, which is like tearing off the rudder of our ship and trusting to a favorable wind to blow us into a satisfactory port. Everyone should have before him the chart of what he expects to accomplish. He should cleave to the line and stand as captain at the wheel for not one moment doubting that he will reach the high goal of his ambition and desire. No evil can come from a well-formulated plan or outline, and these will be found necessary and advantageous in all lines of life. When we think of a railway company that would start to build its tracks without having decided upon a destination and with no fixed end in view other than building from town to town. Yet this is just exactly what you do when you set out on a demonstration that has no definite end in view. Here is, for instance, a man whose demonstration is along the line of health. He knows exactly what, his want, what he wants. His aim is to possess that well-feeling that snaps with vitality, and he goes after it mentally. His end and aim are clearly defined, and he realizes that he has but to apply the principle in the right way to get the results. But if it is, in, but if it is wealth that he wants, he does not set about it so definitely. You find him saying, what is right for me to have will come. He fails to realize that unless he in some measure shapes his desires, he cannot receive. And when the UL starts running, he will have no measure in which to receive because he has not formed the cup of his desire. A haphazard, aimless, waiting state of mind is precisely what kept the man at the pool of Bethesda from getting his health. Instead, as one of the healing places, instead of placing himself in the pool and thereby stirring the waters into healthful activity, he waited until the waters were first stirred, with the result that some active mind always rushed off with the prize. When man makes his contact with God, the infinite sea of substance which surrounds him, that whole sea of substance starts to move in the direction of that mind, as when a small hole is made in the dam. All the water of a river or lake moves towards that opening, ready and willing to pour out floods. Man then, in contact with God, must feel the inexhaustible urge of substance which is pressing towards him, 
desiring to be expressed. Prove me and see if I will not pour out a blessing so large that ye will not be able to receive it. But just how to put this rudder into action is, is what puzzles the minds of the masses. They are burdened with metaphysical fat. <laughs> That's an interesting phrase. That is of reasoning and pondering truth without practical results, but knowing not how to put it into good use and demonstration. If a statement is not demonstrable to you, you have either come, up, come upon a false statement or else have not grown to it and are not ready for its fruitage. Okay, so here he's talking about um, if you haven't manifested what you want yet. Um, so the come upon a false statement, I would think that means that um, not that the thing is impossible, but that the scene or the way you've conceived of it is is you just haven't connected with that state. Um, the construction of it is a little bit too fantastical for your current sense of self. Um, and they hear else have not grown to it. Like you haven't expanded, like that state is still way too far beyond what is possible for you. So you're still moving towards it or just that it really isn't the most ideal scene to catch that feeling. Uh, okay. First then, when you desire to demonstrate the principle of truth, a cleansing process must go on in the mind. Gently brush from your mind by denial all that which is clogging the way. Deny, forget and forgive, and presently you come to a holy mental realm. And fishing, Neville describes this exact same thing, um, and it's it's simply by using the I am meditation, you know, closing your eyes, getting relaxed, uh, shutting out all the senses as much as possible, and using the I am meditation to abandon your present consciousness completely. That's what Walter's talking about here. It is almost a state of mind, which is typified by children when they say play like. You take for granted, accept and acknowledge the desired state, which is not as yet manifest in the flesh or in your affairs. Or in your affairs. Once in this receptive state of mind, you are ready for the second state. Next, you press out further than the narrow confines of your mind and find God everywhere present. You meditate for a moment on what God is and where he is. And now that you are in contact with him, the whole sea or substance of love is moving towards you as the water moves the small as, as the water moves towards the small opening in the dam further you realize that the father is just as eager to be expressed bountifully in your life as the water is to force its way through the opening in the dam um, so this would be the equivalent of knowing uh, that your desires um, are from God the Father. They are what God wants to see expressed in your exterior world. And that, you know, the Father, the creative aspect of you, desires this just as strongly as you do. That's why you have the desire. We feel the great urge of spirit upon us, fulfilling our desires, filling full our desires, which arc very much like balloons uninflated. Now the inrush of this substance fills them until they are lifted completely off the earth or material base. And people say it is a miracle or a demonstration has taken place for it is materially impossible. When you have your contact with God, the infinite power, the next step is set forth in the scriptures. Ask. We are told to ask and there is no doubt but the translation of the word which appears so often is correct. Suppose a child stood by a table loaded with food, hungry and desiring nutriment, but afraid to ask. Would he not more than likely wait long and perhaps in vain for that which he desired? How many of us have not heard some grandmother say, Why didn't you ask for a child? Long ago you could have had all you wanted. So it is with demonstration. We are told to literally ask, and like the child who wanted cake, he would probably make a specific demand for it rather than asking for the ingredients which go to making it up. So he must ask direct. 
that is the difference in having a name, a destination, or a well-formed desire in mind when demonstrating. You might have, and what's interesting is that this is pretty uh, contrary advice to what the law of attraction spaces nowadays promote, uh, you know, which, you know, most famously Abraham Hicks has the whole go general thing. Now, usually when she talks about going general, she's talking about when you have a bunch of negative thoughts going on, um, you're laying a bunch, you're thinking about a lot of things that you really don't want to experience, uh, then going general is, is, is advice there, but when it comes to the desires too, uh, her and other law of attraction teachers have encouraged people to be general on things like health, wealth, and love. And here we have advice, as Neville gave, which is be specific as possible. Include as many details as possible. And Lanyon here is literally saying if you don't have that, that define, if you're not well defining the desire, if you're not tapping into this extremely well defined primary desire, you're not going to manifest it. Or you're going to manifest something that doesn't doesn't do what you want it to do, which is what I talked about when it came to people manifesting secondary desires and never having the primary desire get met. So we must ask direct. This is the difference in having an aim, a destination, or a well-formed desire in mind when demonstrating. You might have placed in your hands all the materials which go to make a loaf of bread and yet be as helpless as if you had not asked and almost starve because you fail to make your desire known. When you need bread, wheat, yeast, water, and sugar do not suffice, you want to finish product. So when you need money, and in, an indefinite asking for a supply and substance makes a disturbance on the sea of substance, but the cup of your desire not being formed, your demonstration is very much like dipping water with your hands. Most of it gets away from you. When Jesus demonstrated sight for the blind, he did not ask for the indefinite thing called healing. Yet sight is contained in health. He said, receive thy sight. So we must learn to use the cup of our desire and ask, knowing what we desire. When you have asked, when you have spoken the word, your next step is to believe. Just accept the thing and cling steadfastly to the completed work. Meeting all objections with the firm assertion, it is done. From this state of mind follows a natural state, that of gratitude and thanksgiving, which is the first and last step in your demonstration. You give thanks that the word is made flesh and now in your possession. But you might say, perhaps I might be asking for a thing that is not good for me. Perhaps I may be unconsciously taking that which belongs to another. You begin your demonstration with your oneness with God. When this is established, when you forget, forgive, and bless all mankind, then you innately know whether or not you're trying to put God's power into a material, selfish desire. Gradually, as you hold conscious communion with the Father, which is within you, you will learn to recognize whether the desire is from beneath or above, and instantly you will destroy or fulfill Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Now here is the departure from most of Neville's teachings. Because when Neville talks about uh, desires, uh, when he delineates them, uh, so he, he doesn't talk about uh, like what Lanyon is talking about here. You know, he, he'll say in this, it said we have divine or beneath or above. Um, what are the other words he used here? Well, the idea is that something is, uh, is a material and selfish desire or um, something which is divine, something which is something the Father wants. Neville makes no distinction in that regard. The only distinction Neville makes in terms of desires is primary and secondary desires. So like the true desire, what you really want, and the way you think you'll get it. Um, for the most part, that's what a secondary desire is. So like if, if your true desire is to never have to work, um, you might spend a lot of time trying to manifest winning the lottery. But you, the, the thing you really want is you just don't have to work. <laughs> like That's like your definite aim. 
It, it may not even be about the money. Though obviously you would need money, you know, for the most part, most people would need money not to work for the rest of their lives. You know, I think the, the lottery is a really great example of a secondary desire. A lot of times people are trying to manifest winning the lottery. They don't want to win the lottery. Sometimes, because they haven't really thought about what they want, they don't even want to have a large amount of money. You know, they just think that if they had a large amount of money, it would fix this problem, this problem, this problem. And sometimes these problems are really vague things like, well, then I would finally feel free. I would finally feel secure. Um, the person who has never respected me would finally respect me and look up to me. Um, they think that having money is going to scratch all those itches. But in a lot of cases, those things have nothing to do with money. And you don't need any money to satisfy those. And all the money in the world won't satisfy some of those things. I mean, so that's that's where Neville talks about distinction between desires and your need to be precise with desires. Now here, this is a small mention. You know, this is only a little thing. Uh, like when, when Lanyon here is talking about sort of a base desire versus a divine desire. And Neville would say, well, it's all a divine desire. What is the unspeakable gift which Paul refers to in the above quotation? Uh, I guess the quotation is included there. Oh, no, it is. You will learn to recognize whether desire is from beneath or above, and instantly you will either destroy or fulfill. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. What is the unspeakable gift which Paul refers to in the above quotation? It is not for grace, for continuing to read, and God is able to make all grace abound unto you, that ye having always a sufficiency in everything may abound unto every good work. It is plain that the gift of which so much is said is the coming into possession of unlimited supply, whether it be money, health, contentment, or love. There is no limitation in the thought, God is able to make all grace abound unto you. It does not say that he is able to make a part of the whole or a limited amount, but all. The Bible is full of promises that great riches shall be bestowed upon us, that great riches are already ours. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places. Thou openest thy hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee thy desires of thy heart. How many times have you read these promises over and over and over, and then wondered why it is that you should not have that you should have to struggle, struggle along in the most limited sense of things. Perhaps your barest needs are met, but always with the strictest economy. Something is wrong with the way we apply the rule, for the rule is correct. The whole trouble lies with ourselves in the application of the laws laid down for us in the demonstration of prosperity. Let us examine the nature of the thing called thought. We have already come to a place where we recognize that thought is productive of its own kind. That when we think a kind thought, it is accompanied by a gentle word or deed, or vice versa. That when we think of action, the body moves, and when we think I can, it produces an entirely different state of feeling and action from I can't. And soon, through the whole category of thoughts, we find them productive of their own kind. If you plant a radish seed, you expect a radish, not a turnip. And here we see a conscious or unconscious faith set into operation. We never plant seeds knowing that they will not grow and that our whole garden will be a failure, we see then that one of the elements of growth is faith. Of course, you already know all this, and when you are asked what it is that demonstrates prosperity, you reply, divine mind or God, and you have already learned that divine mind is right thinking, and that God is no longer far off in the heavens, but close at hand. You have learned that you now have a conscious unity with him, and that you and the Father are one. And you begin your operations from the center of your being instead of trying to work a mystic chain by saying, there is no lack, God is everywhere, and then waiting for something from without to happen. True, certain conditions external to us do operate and act, but only because we place ourselves in the way of these conditions. 
we place a seed in the ground when we are ready for it to start when we are ready for it to start growth. In another place, in a sack for instance, it manifests no growth. This is also true of us. When we get the inside right, we automatically find the exterior conditions such that we cannot fail to grow. Thought then is this is the formless substance out of which things are molded. The cup of our desire is that which shapes it. A child at the seaside with molds fills them over and over again with sand. All about us is the unformed substance. And when we get into consciousness with the Father within and realize that the divine self and the Father is one, we begin molding and shaping this formless substance into the formed. Try this, dear reader. Go within and unify yourself with the Father and start to decree and declare mentally without the physical or material counterpart entering into it. Satisfy yourself mentally that you possess all good, that you are now bringing into existence that which you need. Ye shall decree a thing, and it shall come to pass. Decree does not mean that ye shall wish a thing or desire a thing, but shall declare it as a thing which is inevitable. Again, this is super equivalent to the uh, the feeling quote we have from uh, Neville earlier. Feeling is a deep conviction that it is already done. How many times have you done this? Not many. So how many times have you known, have you said, this is going to happen, decided it, known for a fact, it is going to happen. That's a decree. That's feeling. That's faith. How many times have you done this? Not many. You have thought what is right for me to have, I will have, and sled it along under a burden of poverty and limitation, which was very painful and altogether distressing. There is no virtue in po poverty. It does not help in a single way in as much as sin as anything else, for it is a belief in a limited, selfish, and personal God who deals bounteously with some and is sparing with others. Some have declared that they have all substance without the slightest concept of the mentality of a hundred dollars. They have spoken in terms of millions and held in mind at the same time a few dollars. Now to become conscious of substance is to let go and give up and take for granted as it were that you possessed all. You have no or fear or thought when you get into your bath that you will remain dry it has long since passed the stage when you would think of that and likewise the demonstration of substance must come in other words this is a very long way of saying um, if you haven't manifested something yet um, you either were not specific enough um, when you imagined you imposed a limitation in the moment of imagination or throughout or very strongly throughout the day your mind is not really sorted yet to express this thing totally in the exterior world because you're just simply focused on not not having it um, and here just simply you're not faithful you don't have adequate faith um, the beginning when he walked through all these different stages he included like his recommendation recommendation of the imaginal act he included something that Neville talks about but doesn't necessarily other than the idea of meditation say to include within like your little imaginal act mental movement uh, let me go to it I think it's before this. Uh, well, I mean, this is touched on by Neville, the deny, forget, and forgive. 
because this is the whole abandonment of your present reality. Um, but this part, reminding yourself that God is everywhere and everything. Now you are doing that in an I am meditation. Like you are, you are doing that, but like this specific reminder to self that you are God, you are always connected to God. I mean, that is an I am meditation, uh, but I don't know, something about the way he said it that's a little different. And then reminding yourself that, you know, that the Father wants to express this through you. I feel like these are things where, depending on how you read Neville and who you've kind of learned Neville from, they're like reminders that are outside of the imaginal act itself. But here it's included in whatever you're imagining for. So it's part, it's specifically part of that process. And yes, even though Neville does explain it that way in fishing, in most of his concise explanations of how to imagine, he doesn't include that. Um, the closest he comes in most other explanations is talking about the Jacob and Esau um, uh, metaphor. Okay, now I gotta I gotta find where we were. I think it was before this. Oh yeah, we had decree. Yeah, it was around here. You have no fear or thought when you get in your bath that you, you will remain dry. It is long since past the stage when you would think of that. And likewise, the demonstration of substance must come. When you know that you are one with the Father within and are speaking out this new authority, you learn that you can actually decree a thing and it shall come to pass. So you get yourself in a mentality that refuses for a single moment to acknowledge defeat or limitation of any sort. Assume a mentality which is rich and abundantly prospered. Place yourself in your desired mental surroundings and bring out the vision which is shown to you on the mount. Remember that your very desires, insofar as they are good, are of God and do not originate in you. Like the small you, uh, like your character, your name and identity right now. Praise the first appearance of the operation of this new law. However small it may seem, praise every bit of substance which comes your way, your health, your contentment, your happiness. Praise and bless it all and pass it along. Get very busy giving out joy. Be a giver. See how many happy people you can make during the day. Never let the evil thought of limitation crowd you out into the cold. You have returned to your father's house and all that I have is, is thine. And of course, in the lecture we most recently did, Neville gave, as he gave in so many lectures, the same advice, which is uh, imagine for the other people in your life. Because they're not, they're only a seeming other, they're actually you. Now this is interesting. Try it for one day. And here's what we try. Refuse to let the least limiting thought enter your mind. Like in other words, don't let a limiting thought come into view. When the appearances of limitation come to you, say, I shall not judge from appearances. I shall judge righteous judgment. It may help you to take a check on your treasures at the present time. Take a pencil and paper and list the wonderful things you have to give thanks for. They will increase and increase until they become more numerous than the sands of the sea. And you will have a glorious praise giving. And even the ground you are standing on will become so holy, you will thrill with a new life. Uh, let's try this as an exercise. Um, never let the evil thought of limitation crowd you out into the cold. Yeah, um, I'll try to remember at the end of the stream, but for anyone out there, try it. A whole day where you don't limit, you don't impose any limits on what you think is possible for you and anyone you know. Don't say, yeah, but that, but stop. Like, maybe just eliminate the word, but that's a, that's a good little hack right there. Try it out. I'm going to try it. 
when you come to recognize that all about you is a living, vibrating substance out of which things are created, you begin to feel the unspeakable peace which comes from true understanding. Now, in order to have abundance, you must talk abundance. Never let your conversation get shabby and poor any more than you would think of indulging in discourses on disease. Keep your thought rich and your conversation rich. Someone who says, talk abundance, have abundance. Not that the mere talking will bring you money any more than it does health, but it will mirror forth the thought. And gradually the mind will become so saturated with abundance that it will speak it forth in that which it desires. Be very consistent in this matter. Be willing to start anew with the rule. If you decide to write a letter, you would not put down, Dear Sir, and then say, Well, I have done my work and the letter will be written. No, you would continue writing letter upon letter, word after word, line after line until it was complete. So it is with the demonstration of prosperity. We must keep right after it consistently and not let down until it is made. Refuse to accept lack as a reality. It is only a belief that there is a place where mind is not. And this, you know, is an utter impossibility. What a man can conceive, he can bring to light if he be consistent and persistent in his thought world. Rejoice at every evidence of wealth, whether it be yours or your neighbor's. When another gets it, it only makes your opportunity that much greater and should make you seek a closer knowledge of the law of prosperity. Be not envious of one another. Be glad, be glad, and rejoice. All about you is the inexhaustible source of supply. Do not fix the channel through which substance can be made manifest to you. There are infinite ways and means. All you have to do is get hold of the idea of limitless substance and press it forth into expression. Let no limited or selfish idea enter in. Use this wonderful substance like you do the air and sunshine. You never think of wasting it. Yet you use it in any quantity and without encroaching on the rights of others. It is abundant and it is yours. Think, into, think it into your life. Make it your very own. Claim it as an heir. Decree it as a master. Dwell in the thought until it becomes as much a part of you as health does. Remember that every visible idea of wealth, which now exists, be it house or lands or jewels, can be directly traced to the mental. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of light, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I just want to see... All right, so getting to 100, I'm going to be able to do that tonight. Uh, might just get might get to like page 80 because uh, this, um, this has been a little bit denser than I anticipated. All right, what is it that heals? What heals and is healed is a question that often starts discussion. What actually is mortal mind error, carnal thought? And what is immortal, mind, God, good, as understood in metaphysics. Now this is, of course, uh, not something that we'll talk about. And th this was that differentiation we were talking about just a second ago. When you say you know the truth, what do you actually do? Many times you have pondered this subject and perhaps have dismissed it all with a feeling that you could not give a clear statement of just what knowing the truth is. Now it is true when you think health, your body manifests health, as it does happiness. And since all right thinking, or Neville calls it righteousness, originates in and is of God, and since thoughts, is, thought is the modus operandi of God, the current or point of communication, we find that a mortal mind to which we attribute our healing is composed of right thinking. Then a mortal mind is really right thinking. And it follows inversely that evil thinking is mortal mind or error. It further follows that since evil thinking constitutes the mortal mind, which you fear, 
This very mortal mind is not, as you supposed, a universal instrument which attacks you from the outside, but a recording disc of wrong thinking, so to speak, which is in sympathy with all other minds of the same standard and is universally susceptible and impressionable by the cross currents of mortal thought. So this, I mean, just from this reading here, um, and Walter here is, is calling something mortal thought. That would be equivalent to what we just heard Neville when Neville said, um, uh, you know, doubt is the devil. Those would be equivalent type thoughts. I mean, it would really also be sin. So just be any line of thinking that isn't in line with you already having what you want or with, you know, you know, the total divine uh, image and expression of things. Like, those are the righteous thinking, the right mind, um, state of the wish fulfilled, you could call it, um, you know, a good mental diet. Those would be here. Walter would make all those things to be immortal mind. And then, you know, thoughts of not getting it, you know, lack of faith and thinking against it, getting caught up in an unfolding, all of that he would call a mortal mind. Okay. Knowing the truth then resolves itself into one thing, that of thinking right. When you are thinking right about thing, you are knowing the truth about it. How simple then to know the truth. The moment we change our thought about a thing and place it in the right, we are at that moment knowing the truth of the thing. And as soon as our mind becomes thoroughly saturated with that idea, the demonstration comes out into the flesh. For you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In other words, having the faith, the mustard seed faith, where it is totally complete, totally whole, it is totally unified with that reality. The only thoughts possible are one from the reality in which the thing is already accomplished. For you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth of the whole matter is that you are already free. You only have to put on the practice of freedom to acquire it in the flesh. No more will you have to reach for God to strain and feel after a thing called divine mind, which is somewhere outside yourself, but immediately you start thinking right. You are in the presence of the Most High, of the Father within, and your seed of demonstration is lacing planted. Uh, he is a very present help. We understand why accidents are unknown to this understanding. Since we have the guidance right with us all the while, the power which never slumbers and which is striving to make itself manifest in our lives, instantly then we can start thinking right. If you are ill, you can begin thinking right about yourself. And that moment you tap the reservoir of all healing, and it figuratively starts moving towards you. As you make this opening larger, more and more of it pours in upon you, and you have the completed demonstration. But the key note is that you're instantly brought into the source of all health when you begin thinking right about the situation. Now be not discouraged or overcome if the first good thought you put out does not instantly put to flight the armies of the aliens. <laughs> I don't know the reference there. Stand fast, and it must be a, it must be a biblical quote, stand fast and see the salvation of the Lord. For it is bound to come. It is inevitable and cannot be withheld. The simplicity of it all at first is too great to be comprehended. But as you try this rule, you will find that the reaching after God has ceased. That the straining and worrying to become spiritually minded has been actually replaced by a knowledge. That right thinking is spiritual thinking and is knowing the truth. Um, Joseph Murphy um, has a prayer. Um, it's, it's just like, I know the truth. Uh, I think the truth, like it's just that repeated. I uh, look up Joseph Murphy truth prayer. You'll find it. Furthermore, you, your affirmation, you turn your affirmations within. You address the father within and immediately you feel a nearness of this living principle and feel consciously at one with it. All with years you have been reading the scripture, behold, I stand at the door and knock, wondering how you could let the Savior of mankind into your life. 
never dreaming that he was already within your life, waiting for an opportunity to be brought out, to be let loose in your garden, as it were, to be acknowledged as the master of the temple. And then now, when you say, Father, directing your thought within, the response, Son, completes the perfect union or contact. As, as the word is the thought clothed, as the seed as is the seed which is planted, gradually there dawns upon you the importance of guarding your words. These are the little stones that go into our spiritual building, and if they are weak and selfish, they crumble soon and fall into the dust, thereby weakening our whole structure and making our existence shaky and uncertain. Just have a little sippy sip. Power of thought. Which was first, the egg or the bird? The flower or the seed? You have but to resolve the whole thing into thought to find that, first of all, before either flower or seed, bird or egg, was the idea which rested in the mind of God. For we know that these things were formed and created out of the invisible substance of things hoped for. All about us is this invisible unformed substance un, uh, uh, invisible unformed substance mind from which Jesus drew that which he needed by first forming the desire into an idea and impressing this or pressing this out to the expression in the flesh he knew that it was inexhaustible and unlimited that as long as he drew from the unseen substance he would be supplied but the injunction comes, judge not from appearances. In holding an acorn in your hand, if you say, this little seed has no strength, and such a small thing could never in any way aid the wheels of progress, you are passing similar judgment to that which is passed by the world at large on right thinking. People say, yes, it is all right if you want to delve in pretty theories and thoughts. They perhaps tend to make your life sweeter and more harmonious, but as far as actually producing results, they are nil. But you know that this is judging from appearances, and that when the seed, thought, or acorn is properly planted and cared for, before long these very people find themselves dependent upon the sturdy oak tree to assist them in some way, either to furnish shelter or to give light and heat. So with your desire. It is the seed thought which must be planted, with all the faith that you plant your garden. It must be cared for with the same confidence that you have in the future of your garden. A lady who each year planted flowers always said, Flowers never grow for me. They get spindly and die. They followed in results her lack of faith in them. <laughs> in the same yard, another member of the family reaped a plentiful harvest of whatever she planted. But she had loved her flowers and had long before uh, won the odd comment, if you were to plant a stick of wood, it would, it would grow and flourish. So with our mental gardens. We look out and see gardeners all about us who are planting with differing results. We often hear the remark, I do my work, I know the truth, and yet when it comes to actual results, I must confess they are disappointing. And unconsciously, this very gardener, when he plants his mental garden, has watered it with the thought, it always turns out this way. What could such a one hope for? Um, and this is, of course, talking about assumptions about manifesting. Um, your, your belief in your imaginative power, which can be specific. Uh, the thing I really liked about the exercise I did last time, it was one that Neville suggested in the lecture we did, uh, which is to visualize visiting, um, you know, like you're in the garden, because you are in the garden, being in this grand garden of Eden and going to like your friend's little subsection of their garden and watering their different plants. And each plant um, has a symbolic attachment. So this is like their health plant. This is like their relationship plant, whatever. They have different ones that symbolize different things. So too, you can have that same assumption about your manifesting ability. So you can say like, well, like you have your... Here's your tree of how good you are at manifesting the weather 
And it's like, well, that's the strongest tree in my garden. I can always manifest the weather on a dime. It's no problem for me. And then you look over your money tree. <laughs> Remember that? I'm just remembering those money trees. Look over your money tree, and it looks like a little weed. It's not doing very well. You know, it's just like, well, it's, it's hard for me to manifest money. I don't know. I try all this stuff. It doesn't seem to work out. Every time you say in that, and th every time you think that and feel into that, it's like you are pissing on your money tree. <laughs> like, you know, like you're putting down an insecticide that's killing the roots of your tree. Like those thoughts. Those thoughts are poisoning your own garden. Um, which is why a lot of these like general assumptions about who you are as a manifester, about it's easy for you, you like just naturally fall into the state of the most wonderful things all the time. Like having those, and they they're, tend to be the ones that I put on the screen for like, you know, that stream's um, assumptions. Having those in place, you know, thinking about those, having scenes around those, making those your default beliefs about yourself is so, so important. Because, you know, obviously, you don't want to be engaging in self-denial for years on end. It, it sucks. Okay. Suppose you undertook to instruct a child, and always after giving the lesson, you would say, you will never play well. <laughs> but you could go on through these tiresome exercises. How far would such a one get and with what results? So that this is also why it's super important uh, if you don't do this or have fallen out of the habit of doing it, having a, a book of um, at least logging your manifestations. If you're not logging your desires, and if certainly you're not logging everything, but you're logging the bigger things you encounter every day or every week, um, just to have as a reminder of how good you are like of, of how well rounded you are with certain topics, with manifesting for different things, and then to remind you like how detailed the manifestations can be, how quickly they can come, how much they can surprise you in terms of like they're even better than you imagined. Like just having that to look back on occasionally and be like, wow, I did that, that, and that, it's encouragement. You're encouraging yourself in that moment. You're watering your garden in a very positive way to do that. It's a little regular habit. So our, we come to a place in our thinking when we must add to our work an absolute faith. A positive application of cause and effect must be the principle with which we are guided. And let no doubt or fear overshadow the results. Do not water the ground with tears of doubt. Of doubt. Tears are salt and will kill life. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. First and foremost in your mind is the fact that the work must all be done on a mental plane. You must disregard absolutely the material. Do your work from a mental plane. If necessary, call in that undeveloped faculty, imagination, for your first work must be absolutely mental. If you are working upon a case of sickness, you must first defeat the thing in your own mind and on a purely mental plane, then bring it out into the flesh and see it manifested. If you are desiring a home first, form it perfectly mentally and cling to it like Jesus did. He stood there and said in the case of Lazarus, I thank thee, Father, thou, that thou hast heard me before the slightest manifestation of a demonstration was made. He finished his work mentally, then he added, Lazarus, come forth. When you are using your power of thought, when you recognize this tremendous power, which operated in every direction for Jesus, even to the control of the elements, then you will begin to awake and arise from the dead to a glorious at one minute with the Father within. I've never heard that word before. Uh, at one minute in place of unity or union, you will begin to speak out to the storm-tossed sea of affairs, and immediately a calm will come, which will prove to you, beyond a doubt, that the right power is at last working. I and my Father are one, and the Father being in the kingdom, the kingdom within me, I have but to turn and connect or contact this wondrous source of power with myself, to move mountains and still tempests. Jesus said, who touched me? 
when he perceived that virtue had gone out of him in healing. We all know that merely touching the physical Jesus would no more heal than it would to touch a tree. But he was so closely allied with the Father within that he was actually one with him in power, and the contact with this power set right any wrong condition that came near it. Just as surely as a thing thrown into the sea gets wet and partakes of the conditions of water into which it was thrown, it is inevitable. To further show his oneness with the Father and give to us an idea of what a tremendous power is ours, he said, I am the resurrection and the light. So closely allying himself again with the Father that within that he used the I am in speaking about himself without reference to the Father. There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth him understanding. There is within you that spirit which shall suddenly break, break through your limited thinking, and accomplished in a minute, which you have worked months on in the old way of reaching for a power outside yourself. But some have declared that God is not within you, and with the same breath declare that he is infinite and everywhere present. <laughs> what hopeless reasoning this, when you view it directly and see that the statements are contrary. Either God is infinite and within you, or else there is a place where he is not. Yet Jesus made no hesitancy in saying where the Father was. He plainly defined him as dwelling within man. All things are possible to him who believes. What does this mean? Are we going on from year to year accepting certain conditions as real and others as unreal and unnatural and wait? Nothing is so stupefying, nothing more harassing, nothing more destroying to real life than waiting when we see nothing coming our way. Hundreds there be who are daily praying this unknown principle to bring something to pass, which will be best for them. Are you one of these who study, read, and wait? Then let it be told you that your results will be exactly the same as if you sat yonder at the well and prayed the bucket to dip down and bring you up some water. It is all there, your supply and the means of getting it, but the power which is resident in you, the Father within, must be brought into active service, and then the results are sure and certain. Way back there in the recesses of the most humble and weakened mind is a dream of dominion. In daydreams they mount up the conqueror of every situation, the master of every condition, a triumph and success in every line. This is, dear reader, more than a daydream after all. It is the spirit of the real you, which is speaking and trying to gain admittance into your visible life. Where did these, he's talking about, you know, when you're having like Walter Mitty type experiences of like having the things you want in idle daydreams. Where did these glorious thoughts of dominion originate? In the mind of another? No, they were born within you. It is your birthright which has remained all these years wrapped in the swaddling clothes of ignorance. Yonder in that gorgeous palace sits a master of three hundred slaves. He is weak and puny, and yet there is not a man among his slaves um, that could break him uh, um, but could break him with the greatest ease. Yet unconscious of their power raised in slavery, they cr cringe and slink away from this his very approach. So with us, this mortal slave master is in reality a weakling, and he has stood there with whip in hand, tyrannizing over us, while resident in us is that magnificent power which could break him into pieces without a conscious effort, if we would but use his power. I think what he's talking about here is probably ego, and all of the, um, it's affiliated, um, the things it's oppressing. Now, of course, ego is also from the Father, it's also you know, a manifestation of the infinite God within you. Um, it is <coughs> pretty stereotypically denigrated in spiritualist writings. But I think that's what he's talking about here. And this is like a cool uh, sort of setup of it, of like saying it's like, it could also be fear, it could also be symbolic of fear. 
Um, but whatever this metaphor is sort of reaching for, it's about the feeble aspects of mind that want to limit you and your power. Dominion, dominion. That is the song of your soul. It is the song of your life. It is the teaching of the master. When you come to ally yourself with this father within, a great unselfishness comes to you. A feeling that all the world is your home. And you would no more think of hoarding this precious, precious knowledge and keeping it in selfish reserve than you would desire to preserve for your own personal use a certain quantity of air. If you did this, you would soon sicken and die. You would stifle in your selfishness. For your power would again be sent back into chains of material making and the air would become poisonous with repeated use. Selfishness must be flung to the wind. The great doors of your mind must be opened to the world so that mankind may come and go at pleasure. Love must radiate through you in such a way that it will magnetize your very life for good. You shall draw all men unto you, not for personal selfish ends, but for the glorification of God. No longer do you insist on my this and that. You detach all this and dwell in the absolute. You guard your words as you would select your seeds. You can either grow roses or thistles by choice in the same piece of ground. You can always begin anew as though the ground be tilled to weeds that can be uprooted and new seeds dropped in at once. Such is the glorious progression of man, forever flowing upward and outward and gathering new and fresh impetus as it moves along. All right, let me see, because if this was a longer chapter uh probably gonna end here for today if it's a short one mm, five pages how many total one two three four okay well i guess i'll do this one because that way it'll be an even sort of middle of the book but this, this will be the yeah this is pretty short but this will be the last chapter i do today let there be the record of the greatest demonstrations in the scriptures all show they were the result of let there be. It is still dominant and heard in the land. The command let there be light is still ringing through the ages and when it continue to reverberate until there is naught but, but light. Here and there along life's highway one hears the commands and places himself in position to receive it. If he is earnest and sincere his whole life will become full of light. And he heeds the more personal command, let your light so shine. Later, when the light has come to us, we have the command, let that mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you get the full note of the work let? It does not imply struggle or warfare, but a giving up. Did anyone ever say to you when you were struggling with something or another, perhaps lifting a weight or moving a piece of furniture, let me help you? Do you remember the mental change that took place in you as you accepted this offer? Right away, accomplishment of the desire, desired end came into view. You remained active and did your part, but you felt the aid of a stronger power cooperating with you. And a flow of gratitude, whether conscious or not, came to you, and the whole burden was made lighter. But it is not always added strength which assists us. It is the sweet sense of cooperation which goes a long way toward lightning. Towards lightning. A little child one morning ran up to her mother who was carrying a heavy washing and said, Let me help you, Mama. And immediately a gentle smile came to the tired face and a tender, loving look of gratitude to the eyes. And the load was made lighter. When we desire to cooperate with God, or the rather within, here is the same appreciation and gratitude expressed. And the load for us is made lighter. Uh, when Neville talks about this, he talks about it as a yielding. I mean, you know, the common phrase, yield to the feeling of the wish fulfilled. And if you're someone who's imagined consciously quite a bit, you know what he's talking about. And you know that moment. You know that uh, feeling of relief, that feeling of 
whatever had oppressed you prior being gone in the moment of the imaginal act. And if you did it right, it's, it stays with you until the thing expresses. Is In the case of it's something where the lack of it or the, you know, whatever the condition is currently is causing some form of grief or strain, you feel it in the imaginal act. Um, and here he's talking about the same thing. But then just the knowing that, you know, like, you don't have to do the work. The Father within you does all the work. You just move mentally to the place of accomplishment. That in and of itself should be such a, a burden relief. I feel like I'm kind of too far past the intellectual and then practical and emotional experience of that for it to matter as much. But still, it's a fun thing and useful thing to think about whenever something you want to accomplish seems really big. You can just remind yourself of that and immediately it removes so much of like um, thoughts that would otherwise be, you know, just worry. It just goes away. You're just like, yeah, but it's already it's already done. It's already taken care of. So no matter how complex I personally think it is, doesn't matter. The fact that I can even conceive of it as a goal means it's already an accomplished fact. Take my yoke upon thee and lean on me. Is there anything there that suggests struggle and worry? Is there anything that suggests heartache and trouble? Lean on me. Just forget and forgive the world and lean on me. Did you ever say that to an invalid? Did you ever hear it said and see the gleam of gratitude, uh, which goes forth by reason of it? All these little incidents, while small, our index fingers, which point to the real tender father-mother uh, relation that be God bears towards us, if we will but obey the command, let. By it, the whole matter of living is simplified and clarified. What matter, then, if we have strayed, strayed in by ways of reasoning? What matter, then, if we have sidestepped and fought battles with a so-called cruel world? Now we come into the sweet presence of peace. We rest in the perfect peace for nothing matters but this one thing, that we let the light which is in us shine forth, that we let it thaw the cold, hard, material reasoning and break the icy covering which has frozen the river of life for us. And one day, when the masses pass along, they behold us clothed and in our right mind or place, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And they realize that some wonderful thing has happened to us. You merge naturally into this spiritual state. It's not done by reading long dissertations or by saying rules. It is a surrendering of yourself and a placing yourself in the hands of the Father within. Now the very next time you are perturbed or worried, when everything has seemed to go wrong, and you're in the thick of battle, just pause a moment and go over this let there reasoning. Go over this let there reasoning. Almost immediately as your mind takes on the condition of let, you feel all tension loosening. You're no more in the grip of willpower or mortal thinking. Backing up these arguments with what it, what it is that takes possession of you, i.e. the rather within, and that you are one with him, you immediately come into a new power and use it. You say the condition, let there be light. You say to yourself, let that mind be in me, which was also in Christ Jesus. And you say to the mortal thinking, let go, disappear. This is the exact same as the one I, the one I wanted to open with, which is whenever you encounter a problem, remind yourself that the solution is already worked out and in place waiting for you. It's, you know, it's the same thing here. God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. Where is God? In the kingdom of heaven, you answer. Where is the kingdom of heaven? Within me, you say, according to the scriptures. Then what is it that made? Uh, what is it that is made in the image and likeness of God? Uh, it is man. L image and likeness of God's. It should be a possessive there, an apostrophe. Man is made after the pattern showed to him in the mouth. Man is a spiritual body which is constructed by the Father within. As his body is perfected in our thinking, 
its counterfeit of objectified state takes on more perfect health and strength. Man and God then are not the same, for man is the image and likeness of God. And remember, your divine I or me is one with the Father, which is within. Now you come to a new and vital point. Man is not you. You are not man, but man's spiritual body is the image and likeness of the Father within. Is it not then an easy matter to ally yourself or identify yourself with this one mind, this Father, and then speak out to the image and likeness, the reflection of God, man, body, what you wish to see manifested upon the body? Can you not then have perfect control of man, body, and heal the counterfeit material body of all diseases instantly? And this is a long way of saying that your body is just another your body and your identity is just another manifestation of your true self. This will all come to you as you get into the metal mentality of letting. Allying yourself with the Father within. And handling your body as one who has authority to do so. Nothing can stand before so powerful an alliance. Jesus, the way shower, did not hesitate to do this. He made it plain that when speaking of his real self, he was speaking of that self which was unconsciously unified and at one with the Father within. He had his body under perfect control and refused to be identified with the material body at all, even denying his material parenthood. Uh, he knew that it, it, his parents, um, he knew that his body was a reflection of that which was within and that it was therefore under complete control of the Christ mind. Join this wonderful cooperation with your inner Lord and resurrect your body from the grave. Speak to it and bring it into a natural state. Youth, strength, power. Delineate upon it the beautiful image of mind and bring your divine individuality into light. When love is coursing through your mind, when you love, irrespective of condition, when the great heart of you thrills to do good, not looking for a reward, then you are electrifying your life. You are charging it with a power which will draw naught but harmony to you. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Feel everything full of love and see it burst forth anew with hope and promise. Translate your material loves to spiritual. Purify and elevate them. Reclaim the waste places that have become parched and dried by sensualism, parading in the sheepskin of love. Strip off the covering and be not deceived. Your inner father knows instantly whether the love you have is of the, of the beast or of the father. The serpent in the beginning is still here to tempt and make glowing promises, but in its wake is sorrow and loss of Eden, a uh, serpent equivalent with knowledge. And I guess, I guess it would mean knowledge of the exterior word, world and its current conditions. Uh, now this serpent is not something that is lying in wait for you. It is not something that will attack you from some hidden ambush. But when reduced to its primitive state, is simply evil thinking. So that's how he's going to define it. Um, and evil thinking being you know, that which isn't allied with um, the world of your preference. With the you know the greatest possible embodiment of anything you want uh, to encounter, uh, the greatest tragedy in history was at one time the smallest embryo thought in the mind of a single individual. Had he stifled it, that would have ended it. And again, um, and again, something admonition. I don't know what should be there. And again, maybe idle admonition. And again, the admonition. Watch your words, for every idle word shall be given account of. All true growth proceeds from within, just as the urge of a seed bursts the shell and it comes out. So all action, accomplishments, etc. starts within and comes out. Hear this and heed it. Nothing is coming to you from without either good or bad for it all starts from within and radiates through your being 
and your inner kingdom in the secret place of the Most High, you can accomplish wonders. You can start the urge of perfect demonstration. You can move mountains. Try this, dear reader. Try this inner working. Seek and pursue the peace of the place of the Most High. And you will find that every promise of the Psalms is true. But this is only possible when you realize that it is the Father within which doeth the work. And that you are consciously one with him. That man, the spiritual body, is the reflection of this inner Lord that you are in complete control of the whole situation. That neither time, place, or condition can stop you when you are allied with the Father within. Fear not the stupid predictions of stargazers or false prophets who claim to have mathematical data as to your life. Their doctrine is but one more record of material mind tampering with the divine, and they come to naught, having no legitimate cause and, and resulting only in ashes and dust. God came before the stars, and he is the power with which you are allied. He did not subdivide this power and make you come under the law of certain man-named man planets. Fear not. Forgive, forget, and give up all these material theories and come into the secret place of the Most High. Unify and identify yourself with your Father. Go forth a conqueror, a son of the Most High. This is your birthright. And I, was, I just wanted to pull back and see um, if there was a thing I wanted to reflect on just a bit uh, before wrapping up. I mean, I think for the most part, this is all in line with uh, what Neville says. Um, I think there was like one quote I was looking for here. Oh, the the Lindell refrain. Um, so Lindell Warden, who's one of, um, he was one of Neville's contemporary students, um, is still around, <laughs> and uh, I was gonna say alive, but I was like, nothing here is alive. Um, he he still does talks. Um, he does phone interviews uh, with another person, to Carlo Eskridge, and they post their chats. And Lindell he repeats a lot of things intentionally. That's his style, uh, because you know it, the reminder there is that repetition is the only way you're gonna keep from falling back asleep. It's repetition, repetition, and one of his repetitions is. Uh, the world is not coming to you, it's coming through you. And that is a really great uh, daily reminder uh, to have in mind, and certainly one that Lanyon talked at great length here about today. Let me switch this over to chat. Today. Because that, like knowing that the problem already has a solution, is a great way um, to stay uh, as a purchaser of what Neville would call the pearl, um, you know, to keep yourself having this absolute faith in your imagination, in your power to express anything you desire. I mean, as long as you're reminding yourself of those sort of things, you're not going to fall into what today Lanyon called mortal thinking or evil thinking. In other words, doubt and you having what you want because you know that, well, like... What is there greater than God? If what I'm claiming is through the power of God, what power exists that's greater than God that could possibly deny me? Like reminding yourself of that should instantly stop any negative thoughts, any contrary thoughts. I mean, for, I guess for people who are new to this, who really don't understand the sort of the true weight being discussed here. There's going to be continued faith and belief problems. But once you start accepting that as a truth and connecting with that and knowing that, that all just naturally fades away. 
All right, so next uh, stream is going to be on Saturday. Uh, Manifest1922 has confirmed that she will be back for another chat.